culturellement et ethniquement, théoriquement euh, et ethniquement et est identique, identique, mais qui est euh, constitué par des élèves d'une école euh, catholique. Et on s'aperçoit qu'il y a dans les échanges intersubjectifs une perturbation grave des perceptions émotionnelles, faciales, si bien que ces enfants des rues sont en quelque sorte incapables de répondre correctement aux stimuli qu'ils observent sur le plan émotionnel. Je dirais dans mon langage de tout à l'heure qu'en fait c'est leur deuxième cerveau, leur cerveau émotionnel, qui est malade et qui ne correspond pas mimétiquement, voilà. qui, qui ne reflète pas ça. mimétiquement correctement les émotions qui leur sont présentées, si bien qu'ils réagissent de travers, ils réagissent de travers, de manière incorrecte, à, à des stimuli qui ne sont pas, par exemple, agressifs, ils réagissent par de, par de, par de, la, par de la colère, par de l'agressivité, le plus souvent. Et c'est ce que nous observons, et c'est très intéressant parce que ça prouve à quel point l'histoire personnelle, je, je pense, la, la formation personnelle oui. et, et les événements personnels jouent un rôle fondamental dans la constitution progressive de ce cerveau émotionnel. Did I oui. betray your thoughts? Excellent. No, no, okay. excellent. Thank you so much. Uh, in the final part of my talk, I would like to briefly address another line of research where we have been very active in the last five years, which is schizophrenia. When I started uh, medicine, my original plan was to become a psychiatrist. And I'm happy that because of uh, chance, after the discovery of uh, Neuron Miroir, I was led back to my old interest so I can finally use Minkowski, Binswanger, uh, and the like also in my empirical research. Because what we are trying to do, I mean, you can approach schizophrenia in, in, in many different ways. This is not the mainstream approach in cognitive neuroscience. Most of our colleagues try to establish a correlation between cognitive skills of schizophrenics, working memory, decision making, theory of mind, the blood flow in different parts of their brain, and their genetic profile or alteration of neurotransmission. Our task is very different. We try to correlate the activity of the brain body system of the patient with his first person phenomenology that we try to study using some approaches which are typical of phenomenological uh, psychopathology like, for example, uh, uh, the basic symptoms uh, bone scale, which is one of the instruments we have employed in these studies. This study deals with uh, chronic schizophrenic patients, 10 years on average of disease since the first episode. It's similar to the previous one. This time we, we didn't use the canonical morphed faces, but we hired two actors to perform neutral movements of the face, grimaces accompanied by meaningless sound, crying and laughing with different intensities. Then we presented these stimuli both together with the audio and the video. We presented them with the audio incongruent with the video so they were looking at someone laughing and hearing crying or seeing someone crying and hearing laughing. We presented only the sound or the video alone with no sound. And simultaneously we recorded the activity of the zygomaticus and of the corrugator supercilii. And what we found is that the zygomaticus during positive emotion in the control group is strongly activated, it's the red curve, while in the case of the schizophrenic patients, the blue one, it is almost flat, but it is also unspecifically activated uh, by uh, the cry. So both positive and negative emotion lead to a diminished activation 
of the zygomaticus, which is something you don't see in uh, uh, the healthy uh, control population. A novel finding of this uh, um, study is also that we don't mimic the movement of the face of others all the time, but we tend to do it only when the facial movement express an emotion. When looking at the meaningless grimaces, the right column on the, on the screen, both patients and controls did not activate their muscles. So this form of mimetism seems to be specific for emotions. So the control group activated the zygomaticus when they see and hear someone laughing 500 milliseconds after stimulus onset. So it's a very early reaction. While schizophrenic activated the zygomaticus later and in an unspecific way. We, on average, non-schizophrenic individuals, tend to automatically mimic the facial expression of emotions of others. But different people do it very differently. There is a big, big inter-individual variability. Some of us activate the facial muscle very much. Some of us don't activate their muscle at all. So we divided the group of healthy people and the group of schizophrenic in two. In one group we put those that activated the facial muscles, even if in the perturbed way I show you for the zygomaticus, and in the other group we put the controls and the schizophrenic who did not activate the facial muscles. We call the first group externalizers, activating, mimicking with their face the facial expression of others, and internalizer, those whose muscle remain still. And we establish a correlation between being an internalizer or on externalizer with the accuracy of the rating of the positive or negative emotion they were looking. And it turns out that if you are not a schizophrenic, you are as good if you are an internalizer or if you are an externalizer in assigning a positive or negative attribute to the emotion and in evaluating uh, uh, its intensity. But if you are schizophrenic, if you are not able to facially mimic, your performance, the schizophrenic are the blue columns, as you may see, both with positive and negative emotion, your performance is significantly worse. Which seems to suggest that in healthy controls there are many different ways to understand recognize the emotion on the face of someone else. One is mediated by facial mimicry, the other is not, probably relies on a purely gestaltic analysis of the face. Uh, you, these people base their judgment on how the face look like. They don't need to mimic automatically. What is not clear is whether this apparently identical cognitive performance goes hand in hand with a similar internal response to the emotion of the other. And my guess would be that this internal response to the other can be different if it is not mediated by facial mimicry, but we have to investigate this more deeply. So schizophrenic patients show deficits in rapid facial mimicry responses particularly to positive emotions. This low level deficit leads to a lack of embodied simulation that may therefore contribute to empathizing deficits in schizophrenia. Moreover, weaker facial mimicry leads to a, a deficit in correctly judging the intensity of positive and negative emotion. The lack of motor resonance and related empathy deficits in schizophrenia are constant themes of phenomenological psychiatry, 
You can find it in Blankenburg, Parnas and Beauvais, more recently in Parnas, who is probably the most prominent psychopathologist in Europe, in the world, because in America they don't care about this uh, most of the time, with very few exceptions. They only care about drugs. Uh, this is another interesting approach to schizophrenia. With this experiment, uh, we were testing uh, empathy for touch, so to speak. So this experiment was done in healthy young uh, individuals. They were shown videos where they saw a branch of a tree moved by a, a fan touching a human hand, a hand caressing a human hand, a hand slapping a hand, or again, a hand neutrally touching a hand. At the end of the experiment, we touched the hand of the participants that were lying in the fMRI machine to localize which part of their brain is active when their body is touched. So we were interested to see to which extent there is an overlap. So to which extent the same brain areas that are active when my body is touched are also activated when I see the body of someone else being touched. And we found something new and very interesting. Part of the somatosensory brain areas are active both when my body is touched and when I see being touched the body of someone else. We knew that before. We didn't know that a tactile area, which is clearly not only devoted to the analysis of touch, the second somatosensory area is active not only when our body is not touched, but we see the body of someone else being touched, but the intensity of its activation is modulated by the affective quality of the touch we see on the body of someone else. But the most interesting discovery we made with this experiment is the following. When my body is touched by someone else, I see in my brain not only the activation of the tactile network, S1, S2, and part of the premotor uh, cortex, but also my posterior insula is activated. The insula is a structure which is deep in the frontal cortex, it's opercularized. It was described by Ryle. It's called by Insula of Ryle. Ryle was a, a, a doctor who died uh, in the course of the battle of the nations against Napoleon uh, because he got, uh, I think, uh, uh, typho typhus. How do you say Typhus. Typhus. Ty typhus. Uh, because he was the um, organizer of all the military hospital of the Prussians. Anyway, apparently he also diagnosed kidney stone to cut. <laughs> and now we remember him because he gave his name to this anatomical structure in the frontal cortex. The insula is a sort of relay in our brain between the part of the brain that we use to map what's happening outside of our body with the structure that map our internal milieu, okay? So when my body is touched, I don't not only map this tactile stimulation, but I also have a, a visceral reaction, an emotional arousal, a self-focused emotional arousal, because a part of my body, so to speak, is violated by an external body touching it, okay? So when my body is touched, the posterior insula is activated. When I see the body of someone else being touched, my posterior insula is switched off. It is deactivated, which tells us that sharing of brain states can only be partial. And I think this is highly relevant for empathy. Empathy is not emotional contagion. Empathy means I know what you feel. It's not my feeling which is at stake. And this can be described 
by means of methodological reductionism, also at the level of the brain. So the situation of my brain approximate your situation when I see your body being touched, but it's not identical, and there is a very uh, uh, important difference. My insula, when it is your sensation and not mine, is deactivated. To make a long story short, this doesn't happen in first episode schizophrenic patients. Their posterior insula is not deactivated when they see the tactile sensation on the body of the other. And indeed, two of the patients had to be quickly taken out of the fMRI because as soon as they saw the video, they saw themselves in the video, and this uh, evoked a very strong anxious reaction. They pressed the red button, and we had to stop uh, the experiment just because of that. Another interesting finding in this study on first episode of schizophrenic patient is the reduced activation of their motor cortex, both when their body is touched and when they see the hand of someone else being touched. And interestingly enough, we found a significant correlation between this decreased activation of the premotor cortex and the severity of their first episode as mapped by the basic symptom bone scale. So the more severe the symptom, the less they activated the premotor cortex. So in conclusion, we can say that the borders of the bodily self appear to be blurred, confused, in schizophrenic patients. This is not a new discovery. This is what the clinic is telling us. The novelty is that we can trace this cytopathological aspect also at the level of the brain. This is epitomized by a lack of self other differentiation in the domain of affective tactile experiences, giving the lack of deactivation of posterior insular cortex in patients during touch observation. Reduced activation in premotor multimodal integration regions and consistent correlation between reduced activation, as monitored by the bold signal with the fMRI, and basic symptoms could reflect the neural basis of a reduced sense of a coherent bodily self in schizophrenia. I'm coming to the last two slides. I'm asking myself and to you, does this image make any sense? <laughs> I think it does. Here I put the couch of, of Freud uh, housed in his house in London, but I'm not dealing just with psychoanalysis, I'm dealing with clinical psychology, with um, psychotherapy in, in, a, in a much broader sense. La simulation incarnée peut inspirer et mettre en évidence de nouveaux secteurs de recherche dans le domaine de la psychiatrie et de la psychothérapie pour différentes raisons. Parce que ce mécanisme fournit un modèle général permettant d'expliquer l'aspect préverbal de relations interpersonnelles, lesquelles jouent un rôle important dans le développement de soi parce qu'il peut contribuer à une nouvelle définition de processus psychopathologique, as you saw in the case of schizophrenia, parce qu'il permettait d'analyser, en partant d'une perspective différente, le dynamique interpersonnel non linguistique propre au setting psychanalyte et psychothérapeutique. And I want to finish with a quotation from uh, Isomersi e Salvati, which is a book uh, uh, written by Primo Levi, which deals with the experience of surviving Auschwitz. But here, he, he deals with something very close, I think, to the thing I, uh, I talked about this morning. It deals with the meaning of the word comprendre, understanding. What we commonly mean by understand and I think that this quote is, in a way, reminiscent of the first quotation of René Giral, by means of which I started my talk. What we commonly mean by understand coincides with simplify. 
without a profound simplification, the world around us would be an infinite, undefined tangle that would defy our ability to orient ourselves and decide upon our actions. In short, we are compelled to reduce the knowable to a schema. With this purpose in view, we have built for ourselves admirable tools in the course of evolution, tools which are the specific property of the human species, language and conceptual thought. So this offers a quite uh, unorthodox perspective on conceptual knowledge and language. Language is not the fullest expression of what it means to be human. I mean, it is specifically human, and it portrays an important aspect of what it means to be human. But our experience of others, our relation are much richer than what the schema of language can capture and describe. And in order to make sense of this much richer experience of the other, we cannot study the brain in isolation, but we must study a bodily brain, an embodied brain. Our mind is an embodied mind. Merci beaucoup. Je, je, je crois que je n'ai pas besoin de, de traduire, mais enfin peut-être, euh, je peux juste résumer, enfin que les, les, les recherches du professeur Galézé confirment évidemment ce qu'on a toujours su de la schizophrénie, cette incapacité de ressentir ou de communiquer proprement les émotions, ce qu'on appelle la discordance dans le langage psychiatrique. Et c'est très intéressant parce que lorsque euh, on voit quelqu'un touché, on a finalement les mêmes activations lorsqu'on est normal que lorsqu'on on est touché soi-même. Chez les schizophrènes, il semble qu'on est, est, on est, on active moins. Et en tous les cas, il y a une structure nouvelle découverte, l'insula, qui est activée lorsqu'on est touché et désactivée lorsque quelqu'un oui. d'autre est touché, permettant ainsi de savoir ce qui me revient à moi oui. et ce qui revient à l'autre. Et ceci est n'existe pas, en quelque sorte, chez le schizophrène, chez lequel l'insula n'est pas désactivé oui. lorsqu'il voit quelque chose arriver à quelqu'un d'autre. En d'autres termes, il y a confusion entre le soi et l'autre. Et voilà. Je crois que c'est le point fondamental, oui. mais s'il y a d'autres questions, euh, voilà. Mais ça, je crois que le professeur Galez et Alain, euh, avec cette expérience, j'ai été extrêmement frappé par la pertinence et l'extraordinaire apport que ceci a, amène à la, à la psychopathologie quotidienne même. Ça confirme et ça explique que finalement, il y a une corrélation étroite entre la psychopathologie clinique et la, les neurosciences et les expérimentations. Voilà. Y a-t-il des questions bon, bon, euh, Bravo, c'était extraordinaire comme, euh, effectivement, comme conférence. J'ai une question concernant la, cette période très particulière qui va de la naissance à 1-2 ans, où là, c'est le vide complet et le bébé, l'enfant, doit absorber l'ensemble des, euh, des, des informations qui vont lui permettre de penser, de voir, d'écouter, de, de bouger. De... Et donc là, il y a une période d'acquisition. Euh, et j'aimerais savoir si... Dans votre esprit, ces neurones miroirs fonctionnent à plein euh, à ce moment-là et comment ça fonctionne. Et la deuxième question, c'est tout le monde a eu, euh, enfin tous ceux qui ont eu des enfants ont toujours été étonnés euh, brutalement. Tout d'un coup, ils se mettent à marcher, tout d'un coup, ils se mettent à parler. Est-ce que c'est euh, le, la, la conclusion de ce, de ce travail de neurones miroirs miroir. Et la deuxième question, c'est quelle est la part euh, innée, la part euh, génétique spécifique à l'espèce, puisque l'homme va marcher, mais l'oiseau va voler, le poisson va nager, etc. Well, very, very interesting questions, and uh, I, I, I can start with, with, the, uh, with the evidence uh, we have so far. So, the earliest uh, proof of the existence of uh, motor resonance in uh, Uh, toddlers uh, 
is uh, at the age of uh, four or six months. It's um, an experiment done with uh, a infrared near spectroscopy done by a group of Japanese people. So at four or six months, you already see motor resonance in the brain. Uh, a colleague of mine has shown by means of uh, electroencephalography that neonate macaque show desynchronization uh, at a lower frequency that you normally see in adults. In adults, you see the mu rhythm, which was originally described. The first discoverer of motor resonance is Gaston. Ah, yes. Gaston described desynchronization of the alpha band uh, both during action execution and action observation. So he could have been the first discoverer of a neuron miroir, but he didn't comment on, on the uh, visual desynchronization of the same rhythm. But it's there, it's in the paper. Gaston, in Marseille, je crois. Um, right. uh, oui. So uh, in, uh, in neonate macaque, you already see uh, a rudimentary form of uh, uh, mirroring. So my hypothesis is that a rudimentary form of mirroring is innate, most likely genetically uh, pre-specified. And this would explain how comes that baby soon after birth can display neonatal limitation, as demonstrated by Andy Meltzoff and many others. Uh, the relationship between what is genetic and what is learned today is even more complex to answer this question than it used to be uh, 20 years ago. We are in the age of epigenetics. So we know that our, so we are in a way back to Lamarck. <laughs> uh, not in the sense of, I mean, Lamarck has been ridiculed uh, with the example of the giraffe, no? So by elongating uh, the neck, you have uh, such a long neck. That's not what is at stake here. What is at stake is the fact that gene control the production of proteins, the environment modulate gene expression. Not only that, but the modified gene expression by the interaction between the individual and the environment can be transferred to the offsprings. So, which means that the nature-nurture-divide is less clear than it used to be uh, 20 years ago, if it was ever clear. So we have a constant interplay between some pre-specified, uh, genetically determined uh, uh, information, which nevertheless are dynamically modulated by the interaction with the world, which in our case means that are modulated by the relation with the other. So if you ask me how the infant develop its unique identity, I would say that identity is not a thing, is a process. It's a dynamic process. It, in, it is an ever ongoing process. I am not the same I used to be uh, 10 years ago, not only because my bird is not black anymore, it's, now it's white, but also because my attitude is different. Uh, 10 years ago, I was not a father. Now I am a father. And being a father uh, not only means to have children to look after and uh, uh, to have uh, less money uh, to go to the movies or, or this kind of thing. It means that your perception of the world radically changes. You become a different self just because of this existential change in your life. So your identity is not the same as it used to be. Uh, the child all of a sudden walks, all of a sudden uh, start to speak. How can we explain that? That was, I think, your last, uh, second question. That's a big issue. Uh, we would need a, a colloque, <laughs> an entire colloque to address uh, this question, and probably we, we would leave uh, without uh, final answer. I think that one distinctive aspect that uh, people don't pay enough attention to 
is neoteny. We are neotenic creatures. With respect to monkeys, we spend approximately one year of our life where our brain keeps growing and the development of our brain occurs not in utero but occurs in the world and it is really molded, shaped, modeled by the relation with the other. So neoteny, uh, which means uh, in a way uh, keeping uh, uh, fatal aspect that become adaptive. So a horse, as soon as is uh, is born, stand up uh, on the four legs and can run. A monkey, uh, it takes a little longer, but a baby uh, for nine months, one year, uh, doesn't move. So I think that this neotenic aspect is one of the key elements uh, that uh, uh, explain why with only 1% of difference uh, uh, between us, humans, and chimpanzee, there is a quantum leap forward that cannot be entirely explained by this tiny genetic difference. So it has to, to deal with uh, someone who wrote, besides being a great scientist, who wrote very uh, interesting things on this topic, your, your professor at the uh, Collège de France, Alain Prochain. Uh, Alain Prochain has many interesting answers to this question of yours, I think. Just a short remark. I agree with you about uh, Lamarck versus uh, Darwin. Completely agree. Uh, short remark, because I'm uh, OBGYN and gynecologist of position, speci specialized in uh, fertility, about imprinting. Imprinting is, uh, is able to be transmitted for three generations. Yeah. So this is going yeah. to be very complex. Yeah. Merci beaucoup. Je voudrais demander à Benoît Chante si cette expérience du cerveau relationnel ne le conduit pas à approfondir dans un autre domaine cette notion du visage chez les Vinas. C'est évident. Je vais répondre, mais en même temps. Merci. Euh, C'est tout à fait intéressant comme perspective. Euh, je ne voudrais pas qu'on quitte trop euh, euh, l'intervention de Vittorio Galese et bien sûr Lévinas, avec sa problématique du visage, nous alerte sur la vulnérabilité. Il y a, le visage dit euh, est une injonction par sa seule apparition qui n'est pas une apparition, puisque le visage n'apparaît pas. Il incarne simplement le commandement « tu ne tueras point ». Donc je voudrais, fort de cette question qui impliquerait un, un, un long débat qui n'est pas vraiment forcément dans le sujet, mais qui en même temps le recoupe, euh, euh, ne pas laisser passer, avant de donner la parole à Pierre Bustani, l'expérience qui m'a totalement bouleversé des enfants du Sierra Leone. Et là, en tant que euh, Lévinasien, si vous le voulez, ou Girardien, on ne peut pas ne pas aborder cette expérience incroyable. Euh, je ferai un, juste une, une allusion rapide, non pas à Lévinas, mais à Bergson, puisque il me semble fondamental... Euh, qu'il soit convoqué ici rapidement, dans Matière et mémoire et dans le premier chapitre de Matière et mémoire, Bergson a l'intuition euh, foudroyante, formidable, euh, que le cerveau n'est pas un organe de représentation, mais uniquement un organe sensorimoteur. Il est l'organe de notre adaptation à la vie. Euh, ce que tu confirmes totalement avec cette découverte des neurones miroirs dans une dimension interpersonnelle et, et, et d'imitation réciproque. Mais il y a un Bergson qui se rapproche particulièrement de René Girard, ce qui n'est pas le cas de tous ses écrits, c'est sur l'expérience du rire. Dans le rire, Bergson dit qu'une communauté de gens bien, de gens bien éduqués, comme nos enfants du collège catholique de Sierra Leone, rit devant un inadapté social. Celui qui, par son attitude, montre une mécanique plaquée sur le vivant, suscite une contagion euh, comique, une, la contagion du rire, de la joie, en quelque sorte, qui est décrite par Bergson de manière totalement, euh, euh, je dirais, euh, dans une logique collective, c'est réellement une bouc émissarisation euh, de celui qui fait rire. Alors ce qui est très bouleversant dans cette euh, expérience que tu proposes, c'est que l'inadapté social, euh, c'est celui qui est en prison, l'enfant qui n'a plus les bons moyens de comprendre la joie, par exemple, qui voit le rire comme une agression, qui a donc effectivement la place d'une victime. Mais ce que tu nous fais comprendre, et c'est ça qui est quand même tout à fait bouleversant, 
c'est que l'inadaptation sociale n'est pas une différence biologique, elle est socialement déterminée. Oui. Et que donc ces, ces enfants sont des victimes, pardonne-moi d'être un peu archaïque, mais présélectionnés euh, pour euh, euh, servir à ce rituel sordide. Oui. It's true, and uh, we hope to, to be able to demonstrate, uh, uh, well, we hope to, to see that the same approach performed on younger children show lesser deficits. This is what my, my PhD student, she's a, an obsessive, uh, meticulous person, so she didn't want me to go through the data before the analysis is completed. She only told me that apparently uh, Uh, the deficit is not as profound as in the adolescent, which gives the hope that if this turns out to be true, we, we can say to the politician, to the people who run the country, there was a big scandal because they got a lot of money uh, from uh, um, uh, Bill Gates Foundation to buy a vaccination, and apparently they, they used the money for, for other purposes. So. You always have these problems um, in Italy too. I mean, not at this level, but corruption uh, is um, is terrible. Particularly there, when uh, corruption uh, um, leaves untouched such a dramatic human situation. So, if we can demonstrate that earlier on the emotional dysregulation is not so profound. And even better, if we can demonstrate that an early intervention can uh, reduce the difference between the two groups, uh, I mean, this is a very strong argument uh, to convince people that, uh, if not the local people, people from outside should intervene and, and, and do something. And uh, another aspect, as you were uh, speaking, uh, The more I study French thought, the more I realize how much sensory motor coupling and action is important in the tradition of thought in France, much more than in the English speaking world. Uh, in my field, uh, you had prominent figures, and the figure that influenced me uh, mostly, as we were talking uh, yesterday, have been Jacques Payard uh, in the first place, who was a pioneer of sensory motor integration, and uh, particularly Marc Genreau, uh, who also recently, unfortunately, uh, passed away. And through Marc Genreau, uh, in his book, uh, uh, The Man Machine, I discovered Mendebiran. And Mendebiran uh, is incredible.